I'm just gonna go ahead and wander for a while. Wait. I think I need to hitchhike. You know what, I'll take it. He stopped for me. I don't want to be a dick. Oh, I fucked that up. Excuse me. Help. I was trying to follow this coastline. Did I get across this? Yes. There we go. Did I get across this bridge? Seems I need a car. They apparently don't have walkways? Wait, did you just dump me? <gasps> oh, Jesus. Are we okay? Um... Okay, so the game has some kind of system to normalize your height and figure out how to get you where you're supposed to actually be. Alright, let's try this crossing, I guess. I guess I can't use bridges. It seems that even if you're in a car, it drops you, or it was just a coincidence. Supposedly cars will drop you off before they actually re They won't always take you to your destination, so it might be that the car just happened to drop me off immediately, taking me nowhere. Oh, there's another, there's another person down here. This is none of the previous ones. Let's see whose eyes I can open. Oh, yeah, it just says who the, who the voice actor is. Sorry, friend, but I gotta ask you not to get no closer unless I can see your hands at all times. You look too clean to be one of us. But you don't look like the company sent you, neither. All right, come and share my fire spell. But don't linger. These hills is full of ears. Don't think just because you can't see no one that you're safe. And I'll give you cornbread. Don't be so sure of me neither. Anyway, I need something to laugh about. Got any funny ones? Ooh, a funny one. I gotta, I gotta, gotta get better at this. Still don't know any actually funny ones, right? I haven't even really learned which category would really amount to being the funny ones necessarily. The Devil of Leeds. And the Strange Street. Lost in time. Are these in the same category? Are they both horrifying? I guess this it ended up being the sad story at the end. That's a hell of a picture. I don't think I have funny stories yet. Hmm. No. So let's cheat again, so I can get proper funny stories. I'll tell Quinn's adventure, cheating again. Oh boy, you watch out now, I'll start chuckling. <laughs> Travel? Well, next time you take a train, take a peek on up at its beaten heart, its black breath. That's just what a minor man looks like inside him. Coal dust, smoke, and fire. Got any funny stories? Must have a couple. Oh god, he just wants come he just wants funny stories. I'm so doomed. I stand like no chance apparently. Uh I guess I'll find out whether or not the two brothers thing counts as funny. Two people just crying and hugging and taking a picture in the street and, uh, as cough as all the traffic's honking at him. It's kinda it's kinda it's kinda funny. Come on. Don't try to cheer me up with that lying nonsense. Family. Well, they took my big brother out of school to send him down the mines. He weren't bigger than 10 years old, but 25 cents, right type of handshakes, off he went to work. He's so big in my memory, but he must have been such a small feller, come to think. I need a laugh. Know any good jokes? Oh my god, he only wants jokes. I'm doomed. Uh... Authority, sadness, 
Love, the future, past memories, authority. Freedom. Heaven, desires fulfilled, wishes come true. Faith, trust. Death, change. I need to unlock this whole category. Like, I don't even have it yet. Let's cheat again? I don't know. They say they're wild cards. I don't know if it'll count, though. Focusing on the funny parts of his sadness. What the fuck? <laughs> you got some wit, stranger. Death. Yeah. A little tin of morphine some of us carried down so as to die peaceful just in case. Some thought it better to die sinner than to go with death's hand pulling the breath out of your body slow as he goes. I think God would have forgiven it. He would have had to. What do you think? Anyway, may may maybe tell me some scary story. I'd like that. Oh, I got scary stories. You want to see the devil of Leeds? Damn. Every so often I like one of those scary campfire tales. Oh, sure, I know sadness. Sometimes I get to thinking that just because you're right doesn't mean you ever get your rights. Times like that, I feel like all them coal flecks are just settling in me. Like I'm going to become part of the mountain's guts one way or another. Can you tell me something sad? Sometime you just want a story that goes with how the world already is. I've got sadness. So we're, there's a whole category for sadness though, right? And the love story is probably the one I'd go for. Yeah. The pigeon keeper's here. A couple parted by unemployment. This kind of sadness is where we all meet one another. On level ground. Love. Hmm. Anyone could be a company spy. New woman comes sniffing around. You can't tell if it's you or the union she's looking to get a whiff of. Uh-uh. I keep to my own. Morning. I gotta get going. Hit it up that way. Won't be specific for my safety and yours. If you want to find me, then do it. Talk again about these things. Ole ain't got no country. No worker neither. Worker ain't Virginian, Christian, white, colored, Irish, Polish, nothing. A worker is a worker. We all gotta work. If you're one of them, if you think I sound red, you best come out and say so. Get it over with. You think I sound red? Not quite following that one. If you think I sound red. Hmm. We'll parse as we go, I suppose. Hey! I've made I've made progress three times now. It's that second tier that gets harder, but I end up filling some of these these happy stories and these comedies. There's a train. Looks like it's made of wood from here. It's the aesthetic. By nightfall, the hospitality of this sleepy hamlet, combined with their superstitious tales, has both overstuffed your stomach and filled you with a hollow dread. Folks say these woods are full of apparitions, witches, and worse. You curse yourself for getting on the road so late. In the moonlight, Every valley and hollow at the feet of the Tappan Zee seems like a stolen shred of the abyss itself. Fireside tales seem less fanciful, and every cackling crow and moaning whippoorwill seems like a demon perched on the shivering, spindly trees. But something cuts through the noise. The muffled sound of hooves galloping on the cold, muddy road. When he finally slows his horse alongside you, it's as though he had just appeared out of the mist. He's astride a gigantic black courser, and though his boots are muddy and ragged, he wears an immaculate coat with great, shining buttons. From his saddle hangs an antiquated flintlock and a cavalry saber. In the darkness, you can hardly see above his towering shoulders. 
Greet the writer. His voice is a rumbling croak, deep, but as though his throat is filled with thorns. Have you happened upon a cannonball around here? You can tell English isn't his first language. German is. His hand, so pale it's almost blue in the moonlight, grips the reins in a fist. Sorry, I haven't. You mumble an apology and watch as he silently rides away back into the mist. He's cloaked in black, you notice from behind, but the blood running down over his shoulders glints crimson in the moonlight. Whoa, abrupt change of time. Another story repeated. Curious about that, we keep encountering more and more otherworldly elements. But they're all not so scary if you just get to know them. Except for the demon that screamed at me, but even that one didn't... There hasn't been a lot of consequences for me so far. Which kind of defangs the fear. Kind of makes them more curious and kind of more beautiful in a way. It's break time at this half-finished bridge. The workers are gathered around a young man who sits on a bucket like a king. They listen raptly to his story about the apple orchard planter who planted 10,000 trees. He realizes the story of John Chapman, his orchard, and his dog, but heavily embellished. The young man on the bucket tells it masterfully, doing all the voices as if he's told it this way a thousand times before. What a story. It's nothing close to what actually happened, but this version's pretty good. You'll have, you'll have an easy time remembering it. Hmm. It's the apple orchard guy who planted a thousand trees. He did take his apple- he, he took his planting seriously. It was important to him. It was a sin to do it wrong. That's what I thought. It changed categories now. Because it was a sad story before. The apple orchard. It was it, the emphasis was on the dead dog. Now it seems to be on the planting, so it changed categories to the world. It's a hopeful story of a great feat. That might be one of the ways I can get funny stories is not by finding the funny stories, but by making my stories become funny. Essentially, warped by society. The hotel is an old manor house that's seen better days. A grand structure surmounted by a gambrel roof that dwarfs the house itself. It's eerily still, but for two boys at play. Each one so small and light, they barely leave tracks in the deep snow. Watch them. They seem old for their size around 10 years old. Though their clothes are mismatched, they're perfectly identical, down to the pattern of freckles on their pale cheeks. They conduct their games in eerie silence. Make your way inside. The clerk behind the counter is old, and your room key is worn. But night approaches, and the price is low. Just before you shut the room door, there they are, the twins, staring at you from the corridor. Get some sleep. In the morning, as you leave, the clerk asks, did you sleep well? Tell the truth. Too tired to lie, you tell him about the noise outside your door, the trampling of small feet on the corridor outside. The dreams disturbed with violent and hideous images. That's odd, he says, weak-eyed. There are no children staying with us. Okay, <clears throat> people keep turning out not to be real. Or are they real? That's the question, that's what you can't really tell first off is... Are these people... 
these various instances, are they just not real at all? Or are they imagined to not be there? Like, are they... Are they supernatural things only appealing for me? There's one unfortunate thing going on here, which is that my little minigame here is two separate textures that render over each other, but they don't, they don't sync up visually. The one that, the one that shows up for you to press the, the prompts is misaligned. It's a little awkward. His smile lights up the room, or rather the cab of the locomotive. Folks gather round as he holds the pull cord. He's a showman through and through. You want to cover your ears now for this next part? Cover your ears. Sure doesn't help much. The engineer pulls that chain and the whistle blasts inside your skull. He just smiles through it all. Man must be half deaf. Darn nation! A round of applause erupts from the small crowd. He passes out bubblegum to the shell-shocked kids. Half of them in awe, half in tears. Get shuffled on. Remember now who gets you there on the advertised. Casey Jones. Everyone's all talk as they head back to their seats. That engineer sure is handsome. Gosh. And that whistle sounded just like a whippoorwill, didn't it? Ain't this the way to travel? Sounded just like a whippoorwill. He's the theatrical traveler. Some good whistling here. Does it reflect the song in the background at all, I wonder? You rest in a field where a well-dressed stranger talks your ear off on all manner of subjects. The weather, fireflies, and summer. How combine harvesters work. After a while, the mood shifts. Heard my death bones this morning. Death bones? Death bones. Heard them rattle like clank, clink, clank. More startling than wind chimes in a tornado. He plucks dry grass and chews on a piece. Ain't much time left now. You seem young. That don't matter. I'm fine. Got my savior waiting at the pearly gates. The man shifts uncomfortably. Huh. At least I do as of this afternoon, I hope. Nearly knocked the pastor's door down earlier. Nod. Sure was good to meet you. The man pauses, rubs his chin in contemplation. Don't, um, don't let the bed bugs bite. He walks off slow. After his silhouette becomes small in the horizon, but before he vanishes, you see him collapse to the ground. The man who seemed all right with death. How all right though? I don't know. He seemed pretty shaken. It seemed like it was making it was recontextualizing things for his life. He was in a big rush to go off and try to confirm that he could be saved by going off to that to the pastor. Makes me feel like a dick though. We didn't even check on him. He dude collapsed and we just like, eh, guess he's dead. Not even gonna check? That could all be superstitions. Huge storm, this farmer gasps, pointing to the clouded horizon. We gotta get the produce indoors before the fields watch out. Can you help? You and his family strip the fields of vegetables. When the rain hits, you're all safe inside. You got some coins in your pocket. Some minor encounters for a little bit of cash. Cash I haven't needed so far, but we'll see. I've kind of taken to wandering at random for the moment. There's so much landscape to take in. 
And it seems like I'm, I'm better off starting various quest lines than trying to continue them for now until I have a better arsenal. Because anything you spend on any character goes away for that character for good, as far as I can tell. So I gotta arm myself a bit, become a bit more uh, Renaissance man. The blistering sun has scared even birds into the shade. But a middle-aged woman and a young couple are still collecting scraps of cotton that the machinery missed. With a ragged voice, the older woman calls to you. You got any water? Sure. The three of them rush over to you, suddenly reanimated. They pass around your canteen. When you get it back, it's empty. A woman squeezes your hand and sighs with relief. Sweetest thing I ever tasted, she tells you. They bled me dry. Can't complain. Or maybe I can't complain. But it's, uh, it's rough with their, their situation. So it feels good to help. Should probably get to town. Before I face consequences for this. No fence, gate, or sign marks the entrance to the cemetery. Just a moment ago, you weren't surrounded by graves. And now you are. How long have you been stepping on dead folks, fully unaware? Observe a grave. A wood board, bleached white. Unknown. The word was painted on black by a steady hand, each letter signed with a flourish. Whoever made this memorial had more compassion than money. Hold a moment of silence. Wait. Well, that's a new icon, isn't it? What is that? Look. Let's look around. The other graves are the same. Unknown. 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 Handwritten. Nondescript. You walk for a while, reading every marker in sight, and not once do you find a name. The anonymous grave. It's not. So it's not just a grave for the dead. Not, not a standard gra not a standard uh, cemetery. It's a collection of unidentified bodies. Seems to be the purpose of the entire place, perhaps. Distressingly. By the way, when I had the choice to not give them water, it had like the occult looking like pentagram symbol. I wonder if I might have been cursed if, if I didn't give lend them aid. Or something like that. This farmer's loading besides a couple of berries. I only watch a clap. Oh, yep, want to hear a story? We've heard this one before. But the story's probably new. He starts telling you about the storm generated by the gigantic bird. It takes a couple minutes, but suddenly he recognizes the story about the massive thunderstorm. Whoever told it to the farmer changed, well, a lot, but it's pretty good. Where'd you hear that story? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's just been a family... He thinks it's been a story that he's known forever. Leave him with his tail. He didn't believe me last time anyway. You thank him for his story and start to mosey off down the road. Keep cool, friend. He calls after you. Hmm. So it's changed. I think... I think we'll find that it's a new category now, too. Hard to say for sure. I don't really remember what category it was before, but it's like somewhere in the middle, bottom left, kind of. I think. I think it's probably somewhere else now, because now it's not just a cool, crazy storm. It's a supernatural entity. It's something otherworldly. Oh, I don't think you can go into Charlotte. I was trying to find my way in there. Oops. You know what? Let's look at that map. 
Mmm, just down 17, we'll meet a new, another person. That's what I'm going for right now. Come on, buddy. There we go. Why well, wanna work? I couldn't get in. Maybe I had to keep holding down the right trigger the whole time? Getting tired. He said he stripped the, uh... Stripped the flesh off of me. To make the journey easier. But it seems like I may still need to eat and sleep regardless. I'm not sure what changed exactly. Maybe they just wanted an explanation, because they wanted to make a game where you were a crazy skeleton. Just for the aesthetic. So they kind of just threw an explanation in there for a bit. Seriously, why is this, how does this game have Sting in it? Alright, evolve my stories. Listen to this! Flirts a boy, loitering outside the grocery store. He works his way through a long and strange story about a man who had traveled 600 miles to find a single job. There, he finishes. What do you think? Holy shit, you know the story. It's the story of the couple parted by unemployment, but wildly altered. For a couple minutes, you're too surprised to respond. Seriously, the boy insists. What do you think about that one? It's a great story. He smiles sheepishly. Thanks, he says. I heard it from my brother. Oh. It's not a sad story anymore. Now it's all inspiring. A guy traveling hundreds of miles for a job. Maybe not that inspiring. Well, it's kind of inspiring, but it's kind of still sad, I mean. But it's no longer lovers separated. It seems to be cut off entirely. The soldier sits in the dirt with his legs splayed out, like a child would sit. Beneath the tattered fabric of his antique uniform, several open wounds fester in the hot sun. Lend a hand, traveler? Yeah, I'll help him out. You kneel in front of the soldier. His body is marked with bullet holes, along with deeper wounds that could be from knives or bayonets. Maggots squirm inside the raw red flesh. About time I earned an amputation. You seen any blue bellies around? Blue bellies? The soldier leans in, uncomfortably close, to inspect your features. Were his pupils solid white before now? He tilts his head, narrows his eyes, sniffs you. What are you, stranger? Pardon? A shadow falls on the soldier's face. You damn Yankee! He pulls you in by the wrist and drives a bowie knife into your gut. As the blade bites your flesh, the soldier stares into your eyes, his body dispersing into the wind like a cloud of dandelion seeds. Move on. How in the world does that work? I just got taken the hell out. He just stabbed me in the gut. What does that even do? What does that mean for me? I have flesh to stab in the gut in the first place? That's one of my confusions among many at this point. I have a number of questions. Maybe I imagined I had flesh just like I imagined he existed apparently. But he hurt me for real. It seems. Faded shotgun houses sit in rows under the tall shadows of smokestacks. A worker in full uniform hollers from a porch. Hi, hey, traveler! Throw me inside! Got some literature here! Go inside. As you shut the door, the man glances out the window and draws the shades. Landlord toss you out? Ha! <laughs> Don't mind me, it's none of my business. He pries up a floorboard with a crowbar. You glance over the man's shoulder to see inside the compartment. Canned goods, 
a pile of leaflets, the woodstock of a rifle. He replaces the board and stands. Look away. He hands you a can of whole potatoes, then a leaflet which reads, no evictions, no fascists, no hunger. Headed back to the shop, but we'll have a Bible meet soon. A Bible meet? Bible meet. If you don't know James 5.1 by heart, learn it. That's our favorite scripture. Hey, the help of strangers. That was nice. I'm in a better state now. Austin Walker. Evening there. You looking for a sermon or just a chat? Don't really matter, frankly. First thing I ever learned behind the pulpit is that every homily is just a conversation. Ain't as one-sided as you might think, either. Preachers ain't shepherds. They're cowboys. They gotta run with the flock, keep them directed without fencing them in. So how about you take a seat and guide us somewhere? Lately, my journey's been pretty ordinary. Just walking, church to church. What about you? Been on any adventures? Have I been on adventures? This should be the adventure tree, right? Yeah, let's tell you about Casey Jones, a theatrical railroader. It's a bit of a fun one. I swear I ain't heard a story good as that in a long minute. Travel? Oh, I travel. Moving's in my blood. Pops traveled all over the rest. And even after I stepped out on my own, I kept moving. I've been everywhere. Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Houston, Los Angeles. I even, <laughs> Paris. I even been to Paris. I've been everywhere. Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Houston, Los Angeles. I even, <laughs> Paris. I even been to Paris. Whoops, played the same line twice. Ask me about that some other time. You must have seen some pretty wild stuff on the road. What's the most exciting thing you've seen? Exciting. Hmm, bondage, traps, imprisonment. That's this category. Didn't have a lot of those before. Exciting. What would I call- which one do we call exciting? I'm not sure what we call exciting. Eh, some arrests. You've got a pretty wild life, you know that? Authority? People look to me for leadership, but I tell them that real leadership comes from community. The best preachers are cornerstones, not prophets. Lately, my journey's been pretty ordinary. Just walking, church to church. What about you? Been on any adventures? You're trapping me into more adventures. Ah, gonna be in trouble here. Each one gets its own color. The weird, there's the weird taxi cab guy. I swear I ain't heard a story good as that in a long minute. You ever notice how different folk think about the future in entirely different ways? Talk to a man up in Harlem, hat man, sells hats. And he's talking about quarters and fiscal years. Talk to one of them boys at the Shaw School, they start yapping about automation and aeroplanes. But when I talk to my auntie down in Macon, she can't see past her next payday. Some folks don't have the privilege of the future. You must have seen some pretty wild stuff on the road. What's the most exciting thing you've seen? Hey, Macon. Small world, that. Just because I was thinking about the two voice actors from Walking Dead being in this game. It's like, Macon is the... That's where uh, Lee is from in, in Walking Dead. Ah, shit. Well, his eyes already open, so I guess it doesn't matter what I pick at this point. The women communing with the wood spirits. Hmm, that strikes me as a shallow kind of hope. We all got faith. Every day we stride out into the world, that's faith. 
faith that our time alive is limited and that we must act during our hours and minutes on earth. Faith that what we do matters at all. We all got faith, see? It's just a matter of whether or not we got belief. You must have seen some pretty wild stuff on the road. What's the most exciting thing you've seen? Exciting. I guess the bird, right? That's pretty exciting. Yeah, a storm generated by a gigantic bird. If he believes it at all. You've got a pretty wild life. You know that? Home? Never had a home. Not the way y'all talk about it. And Pops and I had a little trailer for the summer he was wrestling in Atlanta. But otherwise, it was a new floor every week. Well, I gotta get moving on. I have a sermon to give in the morning. And the church is a long night of walking that way. Walk like you're blessed, child. Cause even if you ain't, that's the only way you'll find your holy self. And he's hauling ass out to Georgia. Jimmy's parable. Oh, someone's got my story over here. Probably one of the ones I just told. You spend a while in the cool shade at this gas station. You notice three kids sitting beside their family car, while their parents argue loudly with the cashier inside. The children seem embarrassed. You see the older brother lean over and distract his siblings with a story. He tells them a story about the shootout between the female bootleggers and the cops. You realize almost instantly that he's telling a new version of the tale of the women arrested for bootlegging. But with new, exciting, over-the-top details. When the parents come stomping furiously out of the gas station, you make yourself scarce, missing the ending of the, sto of the boy's new story. But the part you heard is definitely easy to remember. It'll stick with you for a while. Hmm. <clears throat> So at the time, it was just a couple people uh, just standing there asking if we had a smoke. And then we got uh, we got accosted for talking to them because it turns out they were arrested for bootlegging and they're currently searching through their shit. And they would have been happy to go after us too if we were involved. All we got to see was the aftermath. We didn't really have a story. As the what well, was basically the first story of the game, it was actually pretty nothing. But now it's turning into something. Now there's a big shootout and a big scare and all these action set pieces is all ready to be Michael Bay. A long black car growls up in front of this hotel. One st uh, outsteps a woman in an extravagant hat and coat, followed by a whole crowd of hangers-on. Is she a singer? An actress? You don't recognize her face, but to your surprise, you recognize the story she's telling. In a sharp transatlantic accent, she's telling everyone about her party. Uh, everyone in her, in her party, a story about Casey Jones, the fastest railroader in America. It's clearly the story of Casey Jones, the theatrical railroader, but changed in a few entertaining ways. Isn't that something? She asks. Her various followers agree. She pays the driver of the limousine and sweeps into the hotel like a thunderstorm of red velvet. Someone should do a picture about it, you hear her exclaim. I'm still a little confused about the Casey Jones story. There's just so little to it. I guess he just blasted off a little bit, and that's enough to excite some people. Oh, there's another one over here. The bar is crowded with people from every walk of life. Businessmen, young men in, in muddy overalls, and a crowd of girls in slinky dresses, preparing their blood alcohol, <laughs> preparing their blood alcohol content for a night on the town. But it's the squat, sharp-eyed man in the fedora who catches your attention. Start a conversation. He launches into a wild story about the dead woman in the yellow ribbon. Halfway through, he stops, recognizing the look on your face. You know this one. You tell him the story about the elegant woman in the small town. That's it, I like mine more. A wild story about a, a dead woman in a yellow ribbon. In a yellow ribbon. Hmm. More exciting, sure. So that's why I'll keep telling him my way, he says. Let's get another round and do a competitive test on some other folks here, shall we? 
By the end of the night, the whole bar agrees. The new version's better. It might be because your new friend bought them all drinks. Dude's cheating. I don't... I'm not sure what changed about his version of the story, though. A wo an elegant woman versus a dead woman in a yellow ribbon? I thought we already verified that she was dead. In my version of the story. He's small for his age. Boy of 13 or so, sitting on an upturned bucket by the side of a tiny wedge of farmland. The dog, as though by contrast, is massive. An enormous yellow-brown mutt. He's called Rover, the boy explains. Paul says he can't come with us. Where? West. <laughs> you notice the Model A truck on the yard, piled high with furnishings and trunks and bags and knots of rope to tie it all together. And upon all that, too, yet more dust and grit. Paul says it has to be better. Why can't Rover go? With one toe tip, he scratches a parabola on the dead, dry ground. Paul says we can't afford to feed Rover no more. You can't tell where the blonde of the dog's coat ends and the omnipresent dust begins. Same goes for the boy's hair. Will you take him? You should. Rover follows you eagerly after you feed him the tiniest sliver of jerky. But a few hours later, he snaps to attention, as though hearing some distant noise your ears can't catch. The last you see of him are the markings left by his dirty pelt on the leaves of the underbrush. Ow. Oh. This isn't a happy world for dogs to exist in, is it? So he ran off, and we don't know what happened to him. I suppose it's not necessarily worse than whatever was coming next for him. Because they were going to leave him regardless. So, at the end, he's still... He's on his own. 